hey everyone welcome back to my channel so in this video i'm gonna walk you through questions and show you how to figure out the type of jaundice in each question i'm gonna give you a nice scheme uh, so that these questions uh, wouldn't be hard again let's get started all right guys so here is my scheme to think about jaundice the first thing I want you to figure out is essentially um, you know red blood cells are broken down they're turned over every day uh, releasing bilirubin and this bilirubin is insoluble in water in order to get rid of it we need to make it more soluble so unconjugated is insoluble it goes through the liver to become more soluble therefore we can excrete it conjugated bilirubin uh, is therefore water soluble and then it goes through the bile to the intestine and then we get rid of it through stool now normally we do not have jaundice because the rate of turnover of our red blood cells um, is equated by the conjugating capacity of the liver no one is overwhelming the other and therefore you don't get jaundice However, whenever there is an imbalance in this, you know, whether there is extra red blood cells being turned over, overwhelming the conjugating capacity of the liver because of hemolysis or because the conjugating capacity itself is compromised because of a problem with the conjugating enzyme, whether it's completely absent as in Krigler and Ajar or is deficient as in Gilbert syndrome. Or maybe a little bit in between, you know, neonatal jaundice. There is rapid uh, red cell turnover plus impaired conjugating capacity. Both of all of these conditions, guys, happen before uh, the unconjugated bilirubin goes through the liver or before the liver is able to conjugate. Therefore, it's called prehepatic jaundice. So prehepatic jaundice is always a rise in unconjugated bilirubin or indirect, which is insoluble in water or fat soluble. That's why it's very dangerous because it can cross membranes, particularly the blood brain barrier and therefore can lead to kernicterus. So whatever is prehepatic is unconjugated. This is water insoluble guys. Now, after the conjugated bilirubin goes through the liver, becomes conjugated, and then comes out through the biliary tract to the intestine. If it gets obstructed along the way, this is post-hepatic, this is after, has already been conjugated in the liver. So whatever the cause here will be called post-hepatic jaundice. And the type of bilirubin that will be increased in this case will be conjugated. Now, anything can lead to obstruction at this point, maybe coming from the pancreas, maybe a stone in the gallbladder, maybe cancer in the biliary tree itself, or a cholestatic liver disease, all after conjugation has already taken place, therefore it's called conjugated bilirubin. There's so many causes here, either obstruction in the biliary tract, like I showed you, or a biliary tract disease of the biliary tree in the liver, it will also happen after conjugation, so it's going to be conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, um, or after the liver has conjugated, it's not able to excrete it out, uh, like Dubin Johnson or Rotor syndrome. Here's an example of some of these diseases. It will be called post hepatic, and the type bilirubin here, guys, is conjugated and water soluble. I'm going to elaborate more on this in the questions. Finally, if there is liver disease, it will affect the parenchyma, maybe cirrhosis. It will affect the liver parenchyma, therefore affecting the conjugating ability of the liver. So there's going to be a rise in unconjugated bilirubin. And at the same time, it will affect the intrahepatic biliary tree, causing obstruction and will therefore lead to rise in conjugated bilirubin. So whatever there, whenever there is a liver disease, hepatitis or cirrhosis is going to cause mixed hyperbilirubinemia, conjugated and unconjugated. Now, let's take a look at questions to reinforce that. 
So the first question says a 43-year-old man is evaluated in the hospital for medical illness. He has traveled to various countries on missionary trips and recently returned from South America. You need to know, guys, that traveling exposes you to so many diseases you're not used to in your home country. And maybe he came from the United States and South America wasn't really hygienic for him. The patient has no prior medical history, takes no medications. Father has a history of alcohol dependence complicated by cirrhosis support hypertension. You should not gain anything from this distractor, guys, because the, his father's cirrhosis and port hypertension is a result of his alcohol use and has no genetic origin. So ignore this. A liver biopsy is performed and lot microscopy in the tissue demonstrates spotty hepatocyte necrosis and inflammatory cell infiltration. The um, inflammatory cells here, guys, as you can see, are lymphocytes. So this must be a viral illness. On recently returning from a place where he's not used to its hygienic practices. It looks to me, guys, like this is a case of viral hepatitis A, acute hepatitis A. This is the most likely possibility. Now, the question is not asking about the diagnosis, actually going a step further, which of the following is the most likely clinical presentation of this patient? Now, you need to know, guys, that I told you whenever there is a liver disease, there's going to be mixed hyperbilirubinemia. Now, whenever there is a rise in conjugated bilirubin, you know, there is a liver disease right there, there is going to be a rise in unconjugated bilirubin and conjugated bilirubin. Now, when there is a, uh, a rise in conjugated bilirubin because there is some sort of obstruction, its conjugated bilirubin will escape to the blood. And when it escapes to the blood, it's water soluble. It can go down the kidney and will give the urine a dark color. Now, because the conjugated bilirubin cannot make it to the intestine because of obstruction again, it wouldn't be able to give the brown color of stool. And so stool will be pale or what they call clay colored. So whenever there is a rise in conjugated bilirubin, both of these will happen and I need you to remember this for later. There's going to be dark urine and pale stool. Now when there is a rise in unconjugated bilirubin, you wouldn't see any of this. You're just going to see a rise in this uh, type of bilirubin. You're going to see jaundice and probably chronicters later on. So what is the most likely clinical presentation? This patient has uh, an infection, so he must have fever, fever, anorexia, and dark colored urine because of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So the correct answer is B. Now I'm going to tell you guys that clay colored stools, you might think, oh, it's clay colored stools like he told us, and diffuse bone pain. Why would he get diffuse bone pain? Remember guys, some cholestatic diseases um, like primary biliary cholangitis are there for a chronic time you know the patient has it for months to years and so the the fact that uh, bilirubin is not and the bile is being blocked and cannot make it to the intestine at all for a long time means there is malabsorption of fat and fat soluble vitamins like vitamin D which can lead to osteomalacia and bone pain but he doesn't have this and his viral illness is just recent it's unlikely to cause such a thing that will happen very late in disease course with chronic cholestatic diseases now, prolonged pruritus and fatigue would be seen in the same category of diseases I told you about, like primary biliary cholangitis, like primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Um, you know, bile salts escape into the blood because of obstruction right there. All the salts will escape into the blood and will cause itching, pruritus, and fatigue. Again, this and that... A and C apply to chronic cholestatic diseases on a different timeline. This is early and this is late. It has nothing to do with hepatitis A. 
Skin pigmentation diabetes or bronze diabetes is seen with hemochromatosis, but there is no mention of any family history of such a thing. His father is cirrhotic because of his alcohol use, not because of hemochromatosis. Upper GI bleeding and ascites would be seen if he has porter hypertension. He doesn't have it. It's his father that has it. So, no. The only correct answer is B. Let's move on. All right, a three-week-old infant is brought to the physician's office because of jaundice. Note here, guys, three weeks is already past the limit of physiological jaundice, which usually disappears after two weeks. So whatever is going on here, it's pathologic. So I should exclude from the get-go physiologic jaundice. It's just not it. His mother reports that the child has also developed dark urine and light-colored stools. And I told you guys before what we mean by this. If you, if you see dark urine and light-colored stool, it's a giveaway that this is, there is increased conjugated bilirubin. Because it's conjugated bilirubin that is water-soluble. If conjugated bilirubin can't make it to the intestine, it cannot give the brown color feces. So they're going to be pale. And if it can't make it to the intestine, it's going to back up and go to the blood. And because it's water soluble, it can go down the kidney and give the urine a dark color. And so right now, I'm going to exclude any case of conju uh, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Because I know that whatever is up here is conjugated. It's conjugated. So I'm going to exclude the co uh, all causes of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. We already excluded physiologic jaundice. And Gilbert syndrome is one of the causes of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia because of impaired conjugation. Again, I'm going to exclude this. Um, so we're left with biliary atresia or alpha-1 antitrypsin. Let's finish the question. The infant's liver is enlarged and firm on palpation. Both of these are liver diseases. So the total bilirubin level is 7. Obviously, it's too high. If he's past the stage of physiologic jaundice, it's considered too high. Liver biopsy shows intrahepatic cholestasis and proliferation of intrahepatic bile ducts. Now, this is a giveaway that it's biliary atresia, not alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency because alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, guys, shows um, intracytoplasmic inclusions of the misfolded enzyme, which is alpha-1 antitrypsin. It's going to be eosinophilic. Um, so this is not the picture here. I'm seeing a cholestatic disease. Uh, so yeah, like I said, physiologic jaundice should resolve within one to two weeks, but he's a three-week-old infant and biliary atresia is the, a fibroobliterative destruction of bile ducts and can present with persistent jaundice after two weeks. And because it's obst obstruction, it's considered a case of post-hepatic jaundice. So there's going to be conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, dark urine, acolic stools, and hepatomegaly. All right, guys, let's move on to the next question. A five-year-old boy, and I want you to know the demographic here, is brought to the ER due to two days of dark, low-volume urine and decreased energy. Um, dark, low-volume urine means there's oliguria. Okay, the patient says that the boy had, uh, the parents say that the boy had abdominal pain, fever, and bloody diarrhea for four days, which resolved about three days ago with that treatment. The day before the onset of symptoms, the patient swam in a lake and ate hamburgers at a family picnic. I need you to correlate his eating of hamburgers to the bloody diarrhea. And remember, there is only two possibilities here, Shigella or anterior hemorrhagic E. coli, right guys? So he has either of these, and both of them can produce the Shiga toxin, remember? His vitals are normal. Physical exam shows pallor and decreased energy. Maybe he has anemia. He has no peripheral edema or rash. Lab eval shows anemia, thrombocytopenia, and elevated blood urea nitrogen and serum granin. And this is probably why he has oliguria. Remember, guys, this is a giveaway. This is hemolytic uremic syndrome. Hemolytic means there is anemia, uremic, there is uremia, as we can see here, elevated blood urea nitrogen, acute kidney injury. 
Now, which of the funds most likely to be seen in this patient? We already mentioned, guys, that right now he has an imbalance in conjugation. So because of the hemolysis taking place, it's overwhelming the conjugating capacity of the liver. And so he has more indirect bilirubin than the liver can conjugate. And so the correct answer is elevated indirect bilirubin. Now, all the rest, elevated haptoglobin. We know, guys, that when uh, red blood cells break down, hem free hemoglobin is released, and it should be carried by haptoglobin. So you should expect that because of extra hemolysis, haptoglobin will be used up. So it should be down, not up. Elevated thrombin and prothrombin. No, he has thrombocytopenia because of formation of microthrombi, and um, they are actually platelet clots. They are platelet th microthrombi. They did uh, they did not use up clotting factors. So you should expect elevated bleeding time, uh, not thrombin or prothrombin time. There is no clotting factors involved here, guys. It's just the platelet clot. The same goes here for D. Low fiber energy elevated D dimer would be seen if this was DIC or if there was coagulation factors being used up. But no, this is just the platelet clot. If you remember the pathogenesis of HUS, you would know that there is um, damage to the capillary endothelial cells by the Shiga toxin that escaped from the intestine to the blood. And a damage to the capillary endothelial cells will form platelet clots using up the platelets leading to thrombocytopenia and those platelet clots will shear the uh, red blood cells leading to hemolytic anemia with schistocytes and finally because uh, the glomerulus is considered a capillary as well it will uh, damage it and cause acute kidney injury i hope this makes sense guys let me know what you think in the comments all the best guys